Well, good morning and happy Palm Sunday, Campus Bible. It's great to have you here for our second service, those of you who are joining in person, as well as those who are joining online. And I want to, yeah, just say happy Palm Sunday, where we celebrate our King, as He is worthy of it all. Did anyone see the rainbow last night around 6 o'clock? It was like a double rainbow. It was beautiful. Obviously, it just reminds me of the promises of God and reminds me of the story of Noah. And what's interesting about the story of Noah is after the Lord pretty much baptized the world and destroying all corrupt flesh in, on the earth, the ark came to rest on the seventh month of the 17th day of the month. And I always felt that interesting why the Bible would specify the exact day. What's really cool is that's the Feast of First Fruits, where it shows and they celebrate the provision of God and that He's always faithful, new beginnings. And you know what else is special about the Feast of First Fruits? Jesus rose from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits the same day, demonstrating the provision of God in our salvation, where you really see the beauty and how God has crafted it all together. What an amazing God we have. He is worthy to be called king. He is worthy to be called king, especially on Palm Sunday, because that's what we celebrate. Amen? Let's go ahead and stand and worship him as king, because he is worthy of it all. Let me pray before we get started. Father, we thank you for who you are. and What a beautiful thing that you are faithful to your promises, that you provide for us, that you provided a way of salvation. We worship you as king this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The God and firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. Kingdoms when strong now shaken, we trust forever in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Unmatched in all your wisdom. Unmatched in all your wisdom. In love and justice you will reign. We bring our expectations, our hope is anchored in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus, you are the only King forever. You are victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. We lift our banner high. We lift our banner high. We lift of Jesus, from age to age you reign, your kingdom has no end. We lift a banner high, we lift the name of Jesus, from age to age you reign, your kingdom has no end. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You 
are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. is the only king. We stand and lift up our hands. We stand and lift up our hands. For oh, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord. so good and worthy of all of our praise. We worship you this morning. Love, oh Lord, oh your mercy never fails me, and all my days have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will 
Praise you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, worship band. It's good to praise the Lord. Good morning, saints. Good morning. Good morning, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus has come. Our salvation has come. And we praise the Lord. We have to celebrate That's because right. he's good. So we uh, offer you a way to connect with us as usual. If you have something you want to tell us, you need you have a prayer request, or you'd like to change your address, or you'd like to tell us something good about what's going on in the church, write it on a connection card and turn it in. That'd be great. If you're new, we welcome you. Glad you're here. We'd love to give you a gift. So out in the patio, uh, there's a little house out there. They're waiting for you, so go, go see her in the house. <laughs> they usually want to talk to somebody, so please go. So, now there are some things coming we'd like you to know about this week and in the next couple of weeks. First of all, Easter week is upon us. So, uh, today starts the Easter walkthrough experience. Uh, it will start at noon right after this service, so you can go through then. Uh, also, it will run on Thursday and Friday uh, for walk ups. If you had a group you want to take through, that's still available Monday through Wednesday, groups of 10 or bigger. You have a card in your bulletin, a little blue card, tells you information if you want to reserve for a group. So contact us that way. 
Following that is Good Friday service this coming Friday, 3 o'clock over in the Palm Auditorium, so please join us there. It's going to be a traditional Good Friday service, so we're going to be, the elders are speaking, they're going to talk about the last seven words of Christ, um, kind of a time for meditation and, and also to give thanks. And then Easter Sunday morning, uh, three things going on here at campus. First of all, at 8.30, there's a worship service in here. Note the time, please. It's not 9 o'clock. It's 8.30, so come early. And then following that, there's a free brunch in the gymnasium between services. And then after that brunch is a second service at 10.45. Uh, and be advised, child care will be provided for nursery through kindergarten, but anything older than that, there will be no provision, no Sunday school classes at the, uh, older than that. So a couple more things that are happening in our campus life. First one is marriage works class. So this will begin Thursday, April 4th, 6.30 in A201 here on campus. So who should go to this six week class? Well, let's see if you qualify. Uh, if you're married, that could be you. Probably is you. If you're engaged or if you're seriously dating. That's most of us in here. And if you're just not sure, come anyway. We'll, we'll have you go to the class. What will you learn? How to make healthy communication. And topics will be covered such as showing appreciation, Conflict management, you'll need that. Uh, forgiveness, you'll need a lot of that. Spiritual conflict, you'll have a lot of that. So you'll, you'll be able to practice skills how to deal with that. Actually at this class, you have a trained coach that will walk you through that. So marriage works class starting this Thursday. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Thursday, April 4th. And then we have a grandparenting ministry breakfast coming up on April 12th. Uh, we're calling it masterpieces in the morning. So those masterpieces might actually be grandchildren who are present and are doing something. Uh, we have some artwork that's created by one that's a masterpiece. So come and join us. We'll have a fun breakfast and we'll talk about masterpieces that are done by or who are our grandchildren. So before I pray for the offering, I'd like to give you a report on the 40 days for life uh, arrangement that happened. We just finished it. Let me give you a little report. I want to thank you for participating if you did. So the report is that people in 656 cities around the world united together to pray for an end to abortion. And God answered a lot of those prayers. So as of March 18th, it says we know of a 183 moms who chose to keep their babies. So that took place by peaceful prayer vigils in front of abortion clinics. And uh, in this case, uh, here in Fresno down by Planned Parenthood. So here in Fresno also 16 women chose to keep their children here in this area. So part of that's through the Counselors of Right to Life, which is uh, just next to this uh, Planned Parenthood Center. Uh, I took one spot down there, quite interesting. Most of the people that drove by us that were holding signs uh, gave us a thumbs up. We had a few that gave us something else <laughs> that wasn't so good. But we were there. Uh, Kenton and I got to talk to a young lady named Connie and ask us all kinds of questions, and she... She came and kind of challenged us at first, but we talked to her about the Lord. And so it's just a good time. I've been praying for Connie since, and you feel free to pray for her if you think of her. One other thing that's happening in this realm is the March for Life. It's a March for Life in Sacramento, Monday, April 22nd. Campus has a bus going that way. You're welcome to join in. There'll be a rally on the Capitol steps and then a little march around uh, the governor's area, I think. So... Gentlemen, uh, would you like to come forward to take the offering? Please join me as we pray and uh, thank God for these things. Father, thank you for the 40 days of prayer. 
that uh, we could take a stand and proclaim your truth uh, to people who are down there. There's just awful lot of people going into that Planned Parenthood, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you that you turned some away and you got truth to other people's hearts, Lord. So we thank you. Thank you for a chance to give of what you've given us, Lord. You've provided for us homes and, and cars and, and food and money to pay our bills. So we thank you. Now we give back to you, Lord joyfully uh, ask you to bless this offering help us with wisdom to know how to spend it in this congregation and out in the community and even around the world and we pray it in jesus name amen, amen.
the greatest comforts we can receive from God's word is to know his names because all of his names offer us comfort. So I so much appreciate the choir song to uh, kind of usher us into this time in God's word that we're about to jump in on. So, but before we do that, we'd like you to stand for just a moment, say hello to someone near you, introduce yourself to someone new. We can start to make our way back. I think some of you get your steps in, you know, uh, during this uh, meet and greet time. So, now I love to see you reaching across the aisles, getting to know new people. It's so important that we know each other. So, and if I haven't met you yet, my name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here at Campus Bible, and I have the privilege of opening God's Word with us today. And so if you have your Bible with you, would you please take that and turn to Matthew chapter 14 as we continue our study in Matthew's gospel in a message entitled, Jesus Calms Life's Storms. And as we all know, storms will come. It's not if, but when. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, Your name is above every name. And Lord, we know you by a thousand names. And everyone is one you deserve. And we want to acknowledge your names because that's who you are. We want to acknowledge that you are in this place. You are among us here this morning. We ask, Lord, that each individual, you would meet each one where we are today because you know what's going on in our lives and in our hearts. And as we open your word today, Lord, give us something we can take with us to apply to our lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 14, starting at verse 22. Follow along with me if you would. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, Peter became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. In Matthew 14, we see Matthew move through topics rather quickly. Persecution of the disciples in verses 1 through 12 with the beheading of John the Baptist. Provision for the disciples in verses 13 through 21 when Jesus fed the 5,000. And today the protection of the disciples in verses 22 to 33 when Jesus calms the storm. And I don't think it'll take much for me to convince you that we are living in an age of storms. We spend a lot of time and energy battling life's storms. And there are some of you who believe that you have all you need to survive any storm. And right now, I know there are some of you in this room that are facing major storms in life, even watching online, financial storms, 
relationship storms, marital storms, health storms. And when the storm comes, what do we all do? We kind of hunker down and we, we go into survival mode. Then for some of you, maybe right now, life is good. You have a good marriage. Your business is profitable. Your kids love you. Even your grandkids. Well, grandkids always love you, right? But I encourage you, enjoy it while you've got it. Because I have to tell you, a storm is coming. And it's a storm for which you'll have no control. Psalm 46, verse 10, the psalmist writes, Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now, sometimes we forget that even in the midst of life's storms, God is going to be exalted. He will not leave you. His plans will be accomplished, and you will be changed as a result. You see, storms have a way of humbling us. They have a way of making us more dependent on God. Storms have a way of reminding us that we're really not in control of our finances or our children. We're really not in control of our health or our business. We really aren't in control of our country. If you came here hoping to receive assurance that nothing bad is ever going to happen to you, you have come to the wrong place. You see, we study the Bible, and the Bible makes it clear that storms of life will come. Real hope is found in God's Son, and we learn about God's Son in the Bible, His Word. And I have news for you. God has a wonderful plan for your life. In uh, Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33, we're going to look at five assurances from the king when you are facing life storms. They're in your note sheet if you'd like to follow along. And they are, Jesus brought you here, Jesus prays for you, Jesus comes to you, Jesus teaches you, and Jesus delivers you. So the first assurance, Jesus brought you here. Look at verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. So why was Jesus sending the crowds away? Well, he had just finished feeding the 5,000, and the people had seen his provision. And in John's account, John 6, verse 15, John says, So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. They say, hey, we want a king that can feed us every day. Let's force Jesus to be our king. Well, I want to show you something here, verse 22. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. See that? Jesus sends his disciples out on the sea. Verse 23, after he had sent the crowds away, Jesus went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. And who do you think Jesus was praying for in these moments? The text doesn't tell us, but I believe he was praying for his disciples. I think these two verses can give us a glimpse of what's going on in the church. The disciples are out on the sea battling this storm, Jesus is on the mountain praying. The individual believer is fighting the storms here on this earth while Jesus is up in heaven interceding for us. Interceding is a fancy word for praying for us. And I want to be really clear on something here. The disciples are not in a boat on the sea in a storm because they did something wrong. The disciples are in a boat on the sea in a storm because they did something right. And in the midst of life's storms, we often find ourselves having and thinking two different thoughts. Either I'm in this storm because I've made some very bad choices, or I'm in this storm because this is where Jesus wants me right now. And some of you may be in a situation where you're going, hey, wait a minute. I prayed to the Lord. I opened my Bible, I opened up my heart, I decided that I was going to do what Jesus wanted me to do in my marriage and in my business and in this world in which we're living, and now I've got this storm? Are you kidding me? 
Well, did Jesus know the storm was coming? Yes, he did. He knew a storm was going to come to your life. He knew the difficulty. He knew the setback. He knew the pain. So the storm should not be a surprise to us. Jesus says in John 16, verse 33, In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. So it's not if a storm will come, it's when. The Christian is going to face tribulation, suffering, persecution. Look what Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Jesus is in heaven praying for us, and one day he will come for us. But in the meantime, Jesus says, guess what? You're going to face some storms. So after Jesus feeds the multitude, John 6, 15, he quickly dismisses the crowd because they wanted to make him king by force. They wanted to come and put the crown of David on his head. But it wasn't time for that particular crown. First, Jesus would have to wear a crown of thorns. People are ready to serve the king in times of prosperity. But when adversity comes, oftentimes we whine, kind of gripe a little, even complain. We have to realize Jesus brought you here. The second assurance is Jesus prays for you. Look at verse 22 again. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. Verse 23, then Jesus went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now this does not mean that Jesus abandoned his disciples. Just because you're going through pain Problems, setbacks, and difficulties doesn't mean that God is far away. What it probably means is that he's closer than he's ever been before. My wife, Jen, her uncle isn't a Christian. He grew up Lutheran. He heard the gospel. He knows what the Bible teaches. But when we ask him if he's a Christian, he says, no. And we ask him, why not? And he says, I'm not serving a God who would take my brother of cancer at age 16. Then through tear-filled eyes, he says, he had so much potential. He didn't do anything wrong. He was better than all of us. And he was taken from this world before he ever really had a chance to live. So if God would do that to him, I am not going to serve a God like that. No way. We tried to tell him that God has given each of us only a certain number of days and that each day is a gift. We tried to tell him that God has done everything necessary for you to be reconciled to him through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for you. We tried to tell him that in the midst of life's difficulties, he is near to you. Psalm 34, verse 18, it's wrong in your note sheet. You want to change that two to a three says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. You hear that? Near, brokenhearted, saves those who are crushed. That means he's not far away. In fact, in the midst of life's storm, in the midst of the difficulties that are crashing down around you, he's probably closer in that moment to you than he's ever been. So let's think about that for a minute. When a storm hits and the waves start crashing in on you, what's your response? Most of us here pray. Some of you go, yeah, I pray right away. I pray, God, get me out of this storm. Take this problem away. Get me out of this marriage. Get me out of this job. Get me out of this debt. Get me out of this hospital bed. But how often do we pray, God, I don't like this storm very much but I know that you have allowed it. So God, would you change me? Would you grow me? Would you mature me? Destroy my pride, cleanse my wickedness, remove my anger, deal with my bitterness, help me with my fears? Because when you pray that prayer, you're asking the Lord to work right here inside of you, making you more like him and his character his actions, his words. By the way, that's part of the mission of the church. That's why I became a pastor. I wanted to help people. How can I help you today? 
How can I encourage you to be a little more like Jesus? How can I open God's word and, and help maybe to mold you, shape you, form you in the power of the Holy Spirit? The Apostle Paul writes, Romans 8, verse 30, first part of that verse says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. So God is at work, and he's changing us, and what he often uses to change us is storms. And as we read our Bibles, there are actually two kinds of storms. Storms of correction and storms of perfection. Jonah was in a storm of correction. You remember Jonah? Jonah? He disobeyed God, and he had to be corrected. God had a job for him to do. He said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to tell that people that judgment is going to fall upon them. He said, in essence, I hate these people. I hate what they did to our nation. I hate what they did to my family. And if you didn't know it, Nineveh is part of Assyria, and the Assyrians are the type of people who hang their enemies on posts who fillet them, line the city walls with their skins, burn them. They would have their noses, ears, eyes, arms, and other extremities removed while they were still alive. Jonah disobeys God. I think I would too. Runs the other direction. Supposed to go to Nineveh, but instead he boards a boat going to Tarshish, and once they are out on the Mediterranean, God brings a storm that actually gets Jonah going back the right direction to where he belongs. But Jonah was stubborn, just like some of us can be. If I was sitting by my wife, she'd be kind of elbowing me right now. Jonah says, I would rather die than obey God. He says to the sailors, I'm a prophet of God. I'm running from God. From God. If you want these storms to calm down, then you're going to just have to toss me overboard. Jonah knew when he even made that statement that it was a death sentence. Essentially, what he's saying to God in that moment is, kill me now, God. So the sailors fought the storm for a while, but it was no use. So they did what Jonah asked. They tossed him over. Just then the sea became calm, and God provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. God used this great fish to get Jonah going in the right direction. At verse 22, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. They said, we're going to do what Jesus has commanded us to do, just like some of you. Jesus has asked you to love your husband, to love your wife, to pray for your kids, to do what's right. The Lord Jesus has asked you to pray for your leaders, even those you didn't vote for. He's asked you to serve him, to be generous, to not be selfish. And when the circumstance or problem hits... God will accomplish his plans for you and me. Jonah was in the storm of correction. The disciples, they're in a storm of perfection. They obeyed God. God had some perfecting to do in them. Jesus had tested them in a storm once before. You remember in that particular instance, Jesus was in the boat with them. What was he doing? Sleeping. Sleeping. Good. But for the storm we're looking at today, initially Jesus was not in the boat with them. So a storm can either correct you in life's journey or it can be used by God to perfect you in character so that you become the man or woman that God wants you to be. Jesus uses it to point us in the right direction, telling us where he wants us to go. So not only has Jesus brought you here and prayed for you, now the third assurance. Jesus comes to you. Verse 24. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. So the Sea of Galilee is about seven miles long and about three and a half miles wide, and Matthew, verse 24, places them a long distance from the land. John 6, verse 19 says, when they had rowed about three or four miles. For some perspective on this, Bullard High School is about three and a half miles from here. Mark 6, verses 47 to 48 when it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was all alone on the land. Jesus, seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them at, the bo at about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by them. 
So Mark tells us they are three and a half miles from the shore. It's dark. There's a big storm with huge waves. There's no way the disciples can just jump out and swim to shore. And from his place of prayer, Jesus sees the disciples struggling in the storm, just like he sees you and me. He intended to pass them by, walking just close enough that they could call out to him from the boat. Just like when you and I are in a storm, Jesus sees us. He sees the struggle, and he's close enough that all we have to do is call his name. Jesus is omniscient, meaning he knows everything. Jesus is omnipotent, meaning he has the power to do anything. So he sees every problem that exists, and he has the power to do something about it. He's God. The boat is in the middle of the sea. Verse 24 says, battered by the waves. I love that word battered because that's how I often feel when I'm in the midst of a storm. I feel kind of beaten up, battered. I mean, these storms, they, they affect you, don't they? They deprive you, they burn you, they, they hurt you. Tragedy hits and you just feel like crying. The disciples didn't choose this storm. The storm, in a sense, kind of chose them, just like us. And remember, sometimes you can do everything right. You can be in the exact place that Jesus wants you and you will still experience problems. You went to church, you read your Bible, you paid your taxes, you honored your marriage vows, and sometimes, even when we obey, distress, suffering, and persecution can set in. Corey Ten Boom, author of The Hiding Place, hid Jews in her house during the Holocaust and ended up imprisoned at the Ravensbrück concentration camp. Jim Elliott and his team went to the Alka Indian tribe in South America to reach people for Christ. They landed their plane, and this tribe attacked and killed them. But Jim's wife, Elizabeth, took a team back there to share with the very tribe that had murdered her husband and devoted her life to continue the work that Jim and his team had started. We hear stories like that, stories of persecution and martyrdom, and we think maybe my generation will be the one generation that's exempt from the trials, exempt from a bad diagnosis. Maybe I won't miss out on a promotion because I'm a Christian and decide to do what's right, even when all my coworkers are doing what's wrong. And we need to be thankful for every trouble-free moment that God gives us. Because when you read about the storms in the lives of the apostles, Peter, James, John, and Paul, you quickly realize that storm-free living is not the norm biblically. Storms will come. Look what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The Apostle Peter, in his epistle, writes in 1 Peter 2.21, For you have been called to, for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Some of you might be sitting here this morning saying, I don't want to follow in Jesus' steps. I don't want to suffer. I got news for you. Whether you're a Christian or not, we live in a broken world, and pain will come. So let's look at verse 25 again in our text. It says, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. All right, so what's fourth watch? In the Greek, that would be between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning. So Jesus comes to them when it is the darkest time of the night, where the circumstances seem hopeless, where the wind is contrary and the waves are huge. You might be in a pretty dark time right now and, and life is very difficult for you and maybe some of you would even be willing to give some testimony to how the Lord has shown up in the midst of even your current storm in amazing ways. When you look at the text, the disciples don't recognize Jesus at first. Look at verse 26. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. The text here says they're terrified. I mean, think about it. I'm, I'm sure their strength was gone. I'm sure they are almost completely without hope. Let's take a moment to look at the timing here because we have some time kind of indicators in the text. It says, after the multitude had been fed, Matthew in verse 22 says, immediately, so the 
multitude had just been fed. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. That's like they, they eat their last bit. They're gathering up the, the leftover basketfuls of bread and fish. And, and he makes them get into the boat and go ahead of them to the other side as he sent the crowds away. So they're setting out on their journey, the disciples are, to go across the sea. Then verse 23, it says, when it was evening, there's another time indicator. Jesus was there all alone. I'm not sure exactly what evening means. For me, it's maybe around 7. And verse 25, it says, in the fourth watch, between 3 and 6 in the morning, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. Now, even if you take the shortest possible time between those times, 7 to even 3 in the morning, is about, by my estimation, maybe 8 hours. Imagine being out on the sea in a stone storm, rowing a boat for 8 hours. The waves are swelling, the wind is blowing these sharp droplets of water you know, into their faces. They've been up all night, rowing, and their strength is gone, along with their hope. They're in this impossible situation, and all of a sudden, they see somebody walking on the sea, and they're terrified, and they think it's a ghost. And here's these blue-collar man's men, I mean, these fishermen types, these hard workers. I mean, muscles on their muscles is what I picture with these guys. And, and they're crying out, terrified. They think it's a ghost. And Jesus does the impossible. He walks on the water. He comes to them on the very substance that they fear the most, which is the water. He shows the disciples that he is more powerful than the thing that is threatening them at that moment. And when you think about it, what's the worst thing that can happen to us as Christians? It's death, right? But when you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, death is actually the best thing that can happen to you. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55, the Apostle Paul says, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? We don't fear death as Christians. So, number one, Jesus brought you here. Jesus prays for you, Jesus comes to you, and now the fourth assurance, Jesus teaches you. Look at verse 27. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Now, I love that word immediately. It shows up about three times in this passage. The disciples are terrified. They think it's a ghost. Jesus sees their terror, and that word right there immediately brings them comfort and hope. He sees your storm. He sees your struggle. He sees your fear in the midst of the storm. And he gives them comfort and hope. And what are his words? Take courage. It is I. In the midst of the terrors of life, Jesus makes all the difference. We go to God's word. We are filled with comfort and hope. We claim God's promises. We hear the words of Jesus in the midst of those storms. And we take courage because it is Jesus. Romans 15, verse 4, the Apostle Paul writes, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance, and look at these next words, and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. When the storm hits, where is our hope found? It's found in the person of God in His Word. So I encourage you, take refuge in the safe harbor that is Christ Jesus, Amen. our Lord. So number one, Jesus brought you here. Jesus prays for you. He comes to you. He teaches you. And finally, number five, Jesus delivers you. Look at verse 28. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, whenever I read this, I always think the same thing. Peter here, he's in an utter state of terror. He thinks he sees a ghost. Now, all of a sudden, he's willing to risk it all. All of a sudden, He's willing to get out of the boat and come to Jesus? I mean, the storm's not over in this moment. This, the wind is still blowing. The waves are still crashing. But it's, it's possible that Peter's judgment was clouded a little bit in the midst of all the fear and the fatigue and the adrenaline cranking on those oars for eight hours. Stress can cause you to do amazing things, some crazy things. So Jesus exhorts them, and he reveals to them, verse 27, by saying, Take courage, it is I. So where do we receive Jesus' exhortation today? From his word. When things are going bad, we say, I'm going to trust Jesus. 
Beside the empty tomb, remember Mary Magdalene? She didn't recognize Jesus. Why? Her vision was blurred by all the tragedy and tears. The two men on the road to Emmaus didn't recognize Jesus. They were disappointed that Jesus didn't come and do what they expected the Messiah to do. And I think there's times for you and me that we can be a little blind to who Jesus is when he shows up. Why does Peter ask Jesus if he can come to him walking on the water? Was it to show up the other disciples? That's what I thought at first. I'm going to show these guys. <laughs> I'm the best. I think it's because even with all Peter's strengths and weaknesses, Peter wanted to be with Jesus, even in the midst of a storm. And if this is really Jesus, there's no better place for Peter to be than with him. Even if it means leaving the, the safety of this boat and stepping into the thing that he fears the most, the water, he chooses Jesus. Verse 29, Jesus said, come. And Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. And Peter's experience right here has provided all of us with a lot of application over the years. If you've taught this in Sunday school, you've had application. You've been taught different applications. The question simply to me in this is, how is Peter going to walk on the water? He's going to walk by faith. Faith. Romans 10, verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing from by the word of Christ. Jesus says, come, and Peter, uh, Peter hears Jesus' voice and responds to him in that moment. The best way to survive the storms of life and to accomplish uh, the, the impossible that is before us is to hear God's word, believe God's word, and respond to God's word. Verse 30, but seeing the wind, Peter became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. When are we most likely to struggle in our storms? When we forget the source of comfort, when we forget the source of power, when we forget the source of promise and the source of hope. And it seems that Peter, just for a moment, took his eyes off Jesus and his attention once again was focused on the storm. And that's what we do. We look away from Jesus and we, we start to focus on our circumstances. Verse 31. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? Now the comfort I see here is even when we fail, I got to tell you, I fail plenty. Even when we fail by taking our eyes off of Jesus, He's still never too far away. Amen. He's still willing to stretch out his hand and grab hold of you when you cry out to him. And Peter experienced that very thing. Writes as an epistle later on, 1 Peter 5, 7, a verse many of you know, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Peter went through this very thing. You've experienced it too. You've cast your anxiety on him because you know he cares for you part I struggle with most is sometimes I take that anxiety back. Can you relate? Verse 32. When Jesus and Peter got into the boat, the wind stopped. See that? They get into the boat and it stops. John adds in John 6, 21, so they were willing to receive Jesus into the boat and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. That's amazing. I look at this and I actually see four miracles here. Jesus walking on the water, Peter walking on the water. Then when Peter and Jesus get into the boat, Jesus calms the storm and immediately they're at the shore. Immediately, Jesus has brought them to the place where they are going. And that's what Jesus does. <laughs> when he delivers, I mean, he really delivers. Amen. Verse 33, and those who were in the boat worshipped him saying, you, you certainly are God's son. They've begun to understand more about who Jesus is, more about who they are as individuals, and that's what will happen to you as well if you are willing to let it happen. The storm brings deeper appreciation and a, a better understanding of who Jesus is and an even more understanding of yourself and, and others around you. Jesus stills our storm and then he takes us to the destination that he 
has appointed for us. He uses the storm to get us there. We still have three verses left in this chapter, and I'm going to use these last three verses as kind of a wrap-up, kind of a conclusion. Look what happens in verse 34. When they, the disciples and Jesus, had crossed over the Sea of Galilee, they came to the land at Gennesaret. Verse 35, when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all that surrounding district and brought to him all who were sick. And they implored him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak, and as many as touched it were cured. So think about this. No sooner do they get out of the boat from this huge ordeal out on the sea when the men of that place recognize Jesus and start bringing him all these people from the surrounding area to be healed. So it doesn't matter where Jesus goes. Swarms of people just follow him everywhere. And what I see here that I just love is Jesus in his compassion is never too tired. He's never too distracted. He's never put out. He's never too busy. He's never unwilling to heal. Verse 35, all who were sick. When we are sick, when we are in a bad way, where do we turn? Hopefully we turn to Jesus. The people of Gennesaret, they knew that Jesus was the source of healing, wholeness, wellness, so they were willing to bring people to Jesus by faith. What storms of life do you need to trust Jesus with today? Jesus can change your heart. He can change your job, change your marriage, heal your body, help you with your financial struggles. But as important as all these things are, what matters most to God is the condition of your heart. It's the presence of sin in your heart and the absence of hope. He wants to change your life. Amen. Verse 36, and they implored Jesus that they might touch the fringe of his cloak and as many as touched it were cured. My question is, how could such simple faith generate such powerful results? Because the point of this passage is not the extraordinary faith of the people. The point of this passage is the extraordinary power and compassion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Is, it, is compassion a good enough reason to help someone? Absolutely. Have you ever shown compassion on someone who has absolutely no way to pay you back? A couple of Mondays ago at Men in Action, one of the mission guys, this 18-year-old kid, earlier that day had been asked to step down from the program at the mission because of behavior issues. But he still made it to men in action that night. About halfway through the class, this young man pulled me aside and told me what had happened. He said, I had to leave the mission earlier today and I have nowhere else to go. I said, you don't have family in the area? No. You don't have a friend you can call? No. You don't have anybody even one person that you could stay with just for tonight. No, I don't. I said, well, let me see what I can do. Went to Pastor Jim and asked him what he wanted to do about this. He said, let's ask the men if anyone would take him in for just a night so this boy doesn't have to spend the night on the streets. Then tomorrow we'll figure out what we're going to do. He did that, and one of our men stepped up and said, I'll take him in. I found out later that this man let this kid sleep in his bed while he slept on the couch. The next morning, he gave him a fresh set of clothes, and he got him to his 5.30 a.m. appointment. This kid had no way to pay him back. All he could do was say thank you. And friends, that's the kind of compassion we're talking about. That's loving people with the love of Jesus Christ. Friends, Jesus is interested in providing something more to you today than just a full belly and wholeness in your life. Jesus wants to forgive your sin. He wants to provide you with eternal life with him. Jesus wants to offer himself as the bread of life that came down from heaven to feed your soul. So can Jesus still touch people today? 
Can Jesus still heal people today? Can Jesus still be compassionate to people today? Is he still all-powerful today? The answer to all those things is a resounding, yes, he can, right? Good, wow. You guys are, you guys are still awake. Awesome. <laughs> Look at verse 35 again with me. Look at this. They brought to Jesus all who were sick, verse 36, and as many as touched, and I'm going to fill in there, the fringe of Jesus' cloak were cured. They came to Jesus in simple faith. They said, I'm going to touch Jesus, believing that because of his power and love, I will be healed. So I ask you this morning, what keeps you from coming to Jesus in the midst of life's storms? Is it the opinions of men? Is it the sense of your own guilt? Is it the accusation of your conscience? Is it the belief that you've drained God of every last drop of compassion and that at this point he's got to be just fed up with you? He's sick of hearing from you? Friends, I've got to tell you, nothing could be further from the truth. He's right there. And he can make you whole. That emptiness inside of you, the darkness that overwhelms you, the storm that's just raging all around you, the pain and guilt that seems to haunt you and even keep you up at night, he can meet you right there. He can touch you. But I'm going to invite you instead today to touch him. Are you willing this morning by faith to just touch the fringe of his cloak and at the same time allow him to touch you? See, Jesus has everything we need to get through life's storms. And sometimes he uses these storms to bring us to the cross. Uses these storms to bring us to the empty grave. Uses these storms to bring us to a place where we realize our sinfulness and the fact that we have no hope apart from him. None. And he wants to forgive you today and make you new. If you're here today and you've never made a decision to accept Jesus Christ into your heart, claiming what he did at the cross is the only payment for your sin, then I'm here to tell you, you can take care of that before you walk out of those doors and you can be a changed person today. That's the hope. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time together to just open your word. Very familiar story to most of us. Some of us have told this story to our kids at home during Bible study, devotions with our families. Some of us have given this as Sunday school talks. Most of us have heard this many times. But Lord, I pray that today you've brought some fresh application to our lives. That in the midst of the storms, you are right there with us. All we have to do is call out to you. So, Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for meeting us here. Thank you for the things that we've learned. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Brian, for bringing the scriptures alive to us as we go through the storms of life. God is there when we're sinking to reach down a hand to pick us up. He's there no matter what storm we're facing. God is close by, and he wants to meet that need. As you think about your life, as you think of the storms of your life, it's great to have a church family that stands alongside of you to help. And as Pastor Brian said, does, is God still touching our lives? He is, and he's using us as a church to do that in many cases. We have a love fund offering here that we take once a quarter that God uses to touch people's lives in the midst of their storms, the storms of housing expenses that you have no way to meet, the storms of car expenses and maintenance, gasoline, the storm of needing food, or in a transition from one job to another, you don't have any way to meet those expenses when the checks stop coming in or medical expenses when it's beyond your means to pay the bill. Or in one case, just recently, a family who had a, an emergency and that family member was halfway across the United States for us to help them with airline tickets to get there, to be by their family's side and to bring them home safely. 
God is using us in the midst of all the storms that we face. And he's using us to touch people's lives to help them, whether they attend here at campus or whether they're outside here in our community. This morning, we're going to take a love fund offering. And if you're not prepared to give at the moment, you can do so online. But also, as you give this morning, I just pray that you would give in a way that would honor God in your life, share the abundance that you have to help meet the needs of others. And so as the men come, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the blessing of knowing Christ and knowing that, Lord Jesus, you're there no matter what we're facing in the storms of life. Thank you we have a church family that loves and cares and, and will reach out with the love of Christ to help in the time of need. So I just pray as we give today, may we do so cheerfully and out of the abundance of what you blessed us with. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. reminded that our God's love never fails. And I hope you leave here knowing that that's true, believing it's true in your heart. Well, this is a very special week for us as followers of Christ. Palm Sunday kind of launches us into Holy Week. 
This week we have the Easter walkthrough that is going in full. It's all set. I mean, they put all the finishing touches on it yesterday. It opens today at noon, which is right now. So uh, if you don't have other time during the week, Laurel will probably hate me for saying this, but they can only get so many through at one time. But if you want to line up and, and try to get through it, it is phenomenal. But let me just say this, you don't want to rush through it either because there are so many contemplative moments throughout this Names of Jesus uh, walkthrough. It is amazing. If you've never been through one of our walkthroughs, you don't want to miss this. So uh, it will set you up for Easter like nothing else. So let me pray, and I'll send you out. God, thank you so much for meeting us here. I pray, Lord, for every person in this room. Whatever it is we're going on, whether the storms are raging or whether we're in a pretty good season, we're grateful, Lord. We're grateful. Lord, I pray that each of us would know we're a church of prayer. We pray for each other. We share our stuff with each other. We put ourselves out there. We're not afraid to be vulnerable and authentic. And Lord, even as we're here today, we have these prayer warriors on the two sides. I'll be down front. Lord, we know we can get the prayer if we need it and help us to take advantage of that if that's where you're leading. So Lord, go with us, we pray. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, amen. You're just a great week.